Awesome. Hi, welcome everyone. We'll just wait a few minutes to get started here uh, while folks are joining us and then we'll get going. Okay, I'll give it one more minute and then we'll go ahead and get started. But it looks like we're getting a good crowd of people and thanks for thanks for joining us. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. I'm sure some more folks will pop on. Uh, but first of all, thank you and welcome for joining us uh, here at Limbo at uh, for our webinar, How to Implement an Effective Preventive Maintenance Program. Uh, to get started today, I'll introduce you to our speaker, Rick Boggs. And Rick has served as Facilities Integrated Workplace Management Systems Analyst at CSU Monterey Bay and as the Preventive Maintenance Coordinator at Monterey One Water before joining Limbo in 2021, where now he is the VP of Product here. And today, what we're going to cover is why a preventive maintenance program is really the secret to reducing breakdowns four key components of how to how you can build a preventive maintenance program and the seven essential steps to implement a preventive maintenance program as well at the end of the webinar we'll have some time for q a with rick uh, uh so be ready for that and we're looking forward to your questions uh but for now let's go ahead and get started and rick i'll pass it over to you thanks very much katie welcome everybody and thank you for joining us today excited to talk to you about uh how to set up a, a preventive maintenance program so uh, as Katie noted, your top goals as a maintenance team is to reduce breakdowns and downtime, reduce your maintenance costs, and to increase your productivity. Now, in order to do that, you need to have a preventative maintenance program. So preventive maintenance can obviously help, right? So how do we do this? So in order to do this, we are ensuring that our assets are inspected regularly to tackle the problems before they happen. We want our equipment to work properly and more often so their staff can focus on upcoming tasks rather than responding to those unplanned breakdowns. And it allows us to be more profitable by increasing our uptime and allowing us to be more efficient with the use of our parts and our labor resources. So let's go ahead and uh, we're gonna have a little poll right now. And we want to get to know what your current industry and role is. If you could answer that for us, it'd be really, uh, really helpful. I'll just leave that open for a second, give people a, a chance to answer, and then I'll pass it back to you, Rick. Okay. Hey, thanks, folks. Looks like we've got a really engaged crowd, so we appreciate your participation. Makes it more fun, too. Awesome. I'll give it another 10, 15 seconds, and then I'll end the poll. Awesome. Thanks, folks. 
Sweet. Okay, Rick, uh, passing oh, it back my. to you. Great. So let's dive in and we're going to cover the four components of a preventive maintenance program. So the first is to define your, define your goals and your uh, key performance indicators for your preventive maintenance program. Second is to start with your most, most critical assets. And as we know, we want to reduce um, our failure rates and our downtime. So we have to ensure that we're starting with our most critical assets, the ones that are going to cause downstream failures, that's going to stop production, that's going to you know, shut down our plant or facility. And that just allows us to be more efficient with our resources that we have when we're starting a program. Uh, thirdly, we want to create our standard operating procedures and checklists for these critical assets. Here's where we're going to review OEM manuals for maintenance recommendations and procedures. And always note that these frequencies and recommendations can change due to the usage or your operating environment. Uh, next, we're also going to look at, or when you're creating these checklists is look at the information that you have from your current, your current history, right? Um, maybe we see that there are a large number of breakdowns for this particular asset. We may want to increase the frequency of our preventative maintenance here. So depending on which systems that you have in place and what level of records that you have, you can utilize those in, in setting up your frequencies. And next, we always want to customize our OEM recommendations based on our company's needs. So like I said, the maintenance history, but also talking to your technicians. So one of the big things is, you know, certain, again, in certain environments, uh, we may or may not want to do certain uh, uh, maintenance activities based off of um, information that we're gathering from our technicians. And lastly, uh, the biggest component, right, is using a CMMS system. So while it's possible to run a preventive maintenance program using a piece of paper and a spreadsheet, it can just be really hard to organize all that information. So with, you know, hundreds of assets using paper and spreadsheets, it just becomes unsustainable really fast. And and you have to do the paper shuffle and the dance, and you have your technicians that are keeping that information and binders in their trucks. And then when you want to go out and find that information to understand the frequency of these breakdowns, it just becomes really difficult to gather all of that information and put it in a place where you can actually start reporting on that. So again, our, the most successful preventive maintenance programs utilize a CMMS to help organize and automate uh, all of this work. I think, yeah, we got another poll question here. So what is the single biggest barrier or challenge that you're currently experiencing with your maintenance program? All right, same thing here. I'll let this one run for a second and then and then we'll actually share the results for this one because I think it'd be uh, great for folks to see uh, what all the challenges are that everyone is facing. And you know, bearing in mind that it also may be difficult to choose just one. Uh, you may you may encounter more than one, but we're making you choose. I'll let it go for another 15 seconds or so and then and then I'll share the results. Okay, awesome. And sharing out the results, you should be able to see now how everyone responds. Staff, that sounds exactly like my experience. <laughs> Too much work and not enough people to do it. Yep. 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 Well, that's one of the reasons we want to do some prioritization here. Exactly. All Great. Right. So next, we're going to jump into the seven key steps to launching your preventative maintenance program. So the, what we want to do is set goals for our program. We want to ask ourselves, what problem are we trying to solve? So if we're trying to reduce downtime, get control of our maintenance costs, improve our staff productivity, right? Um, it can be any one of these things. But whatever it is, in, our program is going to be more successful if we know exactly what we want to achieve. Next, what we wanna do is uh, inventory our assets. So like I mentioned earlier, we need to inventory our critical assets. We wanna know what assets that we have and, and which ones are our most critical. So what we wanna do is uh, basically go through, do all your inventorying and in-depth asset assessment. This should include everything that comes up under your, uh, your domain and might require uh, maintenance or repair. So this could be 
the buildings that you're that you own, the manufacturing equipment, the vehicles, your HVAC systems, any kind of miscellaneous equipment that your team uses or your facility uses to produce something or to run. Um, and what we want to do is perform an in inventory count, note the current condition, categorize these assets, and um, but the other big thing here is uh, is actually to look at you know what types, what are the makes and models, so we can understand you know what are the commonalities in the, the equipment that we have, and that gets us a really clear picture of what is the purview that we need to maintain. Next is uh, once we have all this information of which assets that we have, we should start with our most critical assets, right? And so the goal is not to be operating with 100% uh, uh, PMs from all of our equipment, but instead to use our preventive maintenance uh, or start our PM program where it's going to give us the most bang for our buck. So by starting with our most critical assets, we're going to get the most out of our PM program in the shortest amount of time. So in order to do that, we need to perform a criticality assessment so we can know which ones are crucial to keep our business running. So like I mentioned, anything that's going to cause a downstream failure, if you're you know, a utility uh, network or um, you're a manufacturing line, if anything's going to cause a downstream failure, that's going to be a higher criticality. And what you can do is you can use a criticality analysis framework, which we will also share uh, uh, after this webinar to go ahead and rank the probability of failure against that consequence of failure. And that helps us develop a criticality score. And you can use that criticality score in this assessment to prioritize the assets that are most important for you to uh, set up your PM program for first. Once we have all of that and we identified which assets that we want to uh, start creating our preventive maintenance tasks for, we can get we can start creating our standard operating procedures and our PM templates based off of, uh, like we mentioned before, our OEM recommendations, which has our manufacturer's man manuals that contains recommended schedules for maintenance, critical spare parts, instructions, um, safe, uh, very important safety information. Next, uh, like we said, we can look at your maintenance history, looking at past failures. Oh, previous one, Katie, not, not, not just yet. Thanks for that. Uh, yeah, defining. Okay, yeah. Um, so also we can look at our maintenance history, right? So looking at past failures, maintenance that has been required with your asset, uh, ones that you know that are most costly. And sometimes, again, if you don't have a system in place, this is going to be anecdotal information that you're going to have to rely on. Um, or that you're going to have to talk to your technicians about. Uh, but by first getting that information, that's going to be really important. Um, and then what we want to do is document all of our maintenance tasks so you know what must be completed regularly and identify the triggers. So this could be based off of some specific time frequency, if it's a monthly, a quarterly, semi-annual, annual, or if it's a usage base. So if it's something that's uh, an hour odometer, or something that we want to do based off of some condition. So if you're doing inspections on your assets and you, know, you note the condition is now poor, well, then we're going to ahead and go, and go ahead and do an additional preventative maintenance task. So there's a lot of things that you can do here to trigger your, your maintenance work. So next, using this information from our OEM uh, recommendation, our maintenance histories, talking with our technicians, uh, understanding you know, what exactly we need to do, we can now document and create our preventative maintenance checklist. Uh, so this is where we're going to take that information and do a step-by-step -step checklist to understand and document what our standard operating procedure is. You know, this can vary. When I know from experience talking from one technician to the other is, What's your standard procedure for maintaining our air our rooftop air handling units? Well, one technician will say this, another technician will, may say that, and they may have very good reasons for doing it the way that they do it. But allowing us to, or creating a standard operating procedure ensures that we're always going to, our, our entire team is always going to be maintaining this in a manner that uh, is aligned with, with our organization and follows these safety protocols. So, after we have those checklists set up, we want to compile all that information in one place so it can be referenced when it's time to perform the maintenance. And this directory can be any type of system. Um, you know, sometimes people have this in paper or spreadsheets or ideally, right, in a maintenance management software. 
Um, and once we have all of those checklists set up, you know the triggers, you know the assets, uh, we can finish building this program out by training uh, and launching it to our technicians. So this is where we want to share it with your team, discuss a plan for all the work assignment and how everything gets documented. We want to measure the, the key performance indicators after the program is launched to understand in our baseline. So are we doing things on time? Are we doing things late? What's our uh, completion percentage? And then we want to optimize the preventive maintenance schedules as the program one, runs. So as these PM, PMs are getting completed, we can note, uh, you know, our technicians observe that, hey, this thing is still failing, even though we're doing preventive maintenance at this rate. Let's go ahead and adjust that to increase the frequency or decrease, again, based off the observations to optimize our, um, our schedules. All right, another poll time. So we want to know if you're currently using a system to manage maintenance, and if so, what kind of system are you using? All right. Answers coming in. Thanks, folks. Keep coming. I'll give it another 15 seconds. Awesome. Cool, cool, cool. All right, all right. moving so, on. Uh, as we mentioned, right, you know, ideally this all gets done with a CMMS. And what we want to underscore here is what, what is the problem with using papers and spreadsheets to manage all this information? Uh, you have to manually assign all of the work. Uh, you have to go in and look at who's available, go ahead and assign that out to each individual or team. Um, and that leads directly into managing all the documentation is difficult. You have to have papers for every single work that needs to be done. You need to take that and log it back into some system so that you can potentially have some uh, visibility on your KPIs of what work is actually getting done or not getting done. And so this whole paper shuffle, as we know it, is, is just, uh, you know, very taxing, right? And not really scalable, especially when you become a larger organization. So what are the five key benefits of using a CMS to manage your preventative maintenance? So we can, like we said, create custom SOPs and checklists. We can automate um, all of our scheduling and prioritization of our tasks. We can automate the reporting to monitor our KPIs. We can track our parts usage alongside of our assets so our maintenance stays on time. And we can reduce our unexpected downtime. Now, uh, what we want to do next is get into a customer testimonial that has, uh, by using Wimble, they were able to you know, significantly re reduce their downtime. So our customer, Tara Manufacturing, has seen great results with Wimble. They were specializing in industrial cutting and sewing and radio frequency welding and plastic fabrication. They have committed themselves to modern equipment, process efficiency, and technical innovation. And before Wimble, there was no maintenance program. Equipment would run until it broke down, inflating their downtime rate to 90%. This led to a high degree of stress, overtime costs, loss production. And Carlos Melendez, their maintenance supervisor at Tara, they said, before we had Limble, we had downed machines. And there was such a big issue because we didn't have a maintenance program. The machines were really just not taken care of. It was a run to failure operation. And now their downtime rate has reduced to less than 15% from that 90% that they started at. And they experienced significant financial benefits as well, as you can imagine. In one month, they saved over $10,000 in downtime, which adds up to over $100,000 in just their first year of implementation. And next, what we would like to do is show you a video uh, where he can explain that and share his story for, uh, from himself. Let me try that again. Without Limble, 
it would be very, very frustrating, and I, and I doubt I would want to come into work. But with Limbo here, it makes it very easy to run a department. So right now, we'll go to the cut table. This is where everything starts after CAD. My name is Carlos Melendez. I'm the maintenance supervisor here at Terra Manufacturer at Owens Crossroad, Alabama. When I first hired in, I asked if there's a maintenance program here, and I was told no. So I was like, okay. I said, well, this is, this is what I would like. If I'm hired, this is what I would like to do. There, there wasn't scheduled in, so machines would just basically run until they broke. Yeah. And they would, then, then they would buy another one. Before we had Limble, things would tear down a lot, so we didn't have an idea about what was actually down. It really wasn't, did I want Limble or not? It, it was kind of a no-brainer. You know, Limble was actually, to me, was the best out on the market. So the QR codes for our assets out here is, is probably the best thing I like. They can take a picture with their phone and send it in. So we have a record of how that machine performed that year. Second would be the parts, you know, because we gotta have parts in stock. And so for us to never go without parts, I mean, that's, that's really a big deal in any maintenance program. Because if you're having to wait on parts, you're losing money. So with Limble, those, those days are in the past. The money we saved, I think last month I had a, a, a data sheet. We saved $10,000 just last month. Now that we've got things up and running and you know everybody knows you know when you take care of things, they tend to run better. So when I'm at home, I can be at home. So that I don't lose, I, I've actually gained more family time at home. Since we've got it, it is really, we haven't looked back and we're not gonna look back. It saves us money on wait time, downtime, parts, people not, not actually paying employees to work when their machine is down. So when you do all the numbers, I mean, there's, it's over probably a couple hundred thousand dollars that, that it's helped us save. Limbo is the last thing I have to worry about. I don't worry about anything. I'll worry about machines breaking down. That's the only issue I have. I love using Limble. I can't wait to get here to use it, and I can't wait to see what else we can use with it in the future. Okay, awesome. Um, we'll take some time now to open it up for Q and A. So, uh, on your screens, if you're, if you're not on the phone, if on your screens, you should see a little box that says Q and A. Uh, and if you have any questions, uh, feel free to toss them in. Uh, and you know, in the meet, or you can send them in the chat too. I'll keep an eye on that. Um, if you have access to that. Okay, uh, one question that I would uh, is coming from the chat uh, is uh, for you, Rick. Uh, what are you? What have you seen as the biggest um, like mistakes that people make when trying to implement uh, a PM program? Yeah, I think the the biggest thing that we we noted on is is trying to do too much too fast, right? Uh, really spend the time and look at and inventory your assets to understand what are your most critical assets to have a preventive maintenance program on and, and do the work to go ahead and set those up first. And so that's where I see it fail, right? People get overwhelmed with, man, I have every single air handler. I have all these fans. I have all of these, you know, different pieces of equipment across my entire facility. And, you know, you just get overwhelmed, right? You're trying to do too much. And all of a sudden you drop all of that on your team. So go ahead and start small validate and then go and build out from there. Awesome. Uh, another question. Uh, uh, the question says, I am currently working on a PM schedule. I noticed there's a lot of resistance from personnel. What should I do? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting one. Um, specifically, you know, it'd be if, if it's personnel, is that from your technicians or is that from management to have uh, preventive maintenance? Um, you know, 
the benefit there is really just trying to show them what's the return on investment, right? Uh, I think people can see like, oh man, why, why do I want to do all this additional work? I don't understand why, what, what our actual return is. So yeah, there's just has to be a lot of communication and, um, and, and education, frankly, right, of why this is actually going to be better, beneficial to not us, but also to our organization. Um, and really dig into what is the resistance, right? So anytime we have these uh, discussions about, you know, why somebody doesn't want to do something or why something doesn't get adopted, we really want to try and dig into the root of the problem. So we want to ask more questions to understand what's the core thing stopping you? Is it, you know, a feeling of uh, insecurity about the, about your job? Because, you know, now I have to make sure that everything is done at the right time. Is it um, that, you know, oh, now my maintenance manager is going to be tracking everything that I'm doing. Um, and they're worried about that. You know, what, what is it? Um, so I would definitely encourage to, to really open that door to communication and ensure that you really get to that root of the understanding of, of what that problem really is. Yeah. So on that same note, we can keep digging a little bit deeper, actually, even because I got another response, which is like for those technicians that are afraid to lose their freedom with uh, a PM program, what are like the the talking points or the tips that you could give uh, for easing that insecurity? Yeah. I mean, when we looked at this yeah, and, and previously in my experience, when we were talking with, with all of our technicians, um, you know, they would, it would be frustrated in that man, well, I have to, I have my notebook of exactly which items I need to do or which, which items or parts that I need to go grab. And they had to manage all this information on their little books. And they, you know, didn't really want to share that with other technicians. And we had to just say, no, 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 we're, we're stopping all of this. You know, you don't need to be a silo for information uh, and kind of protect your little realm here. This is just not what we're doing. So you have to have that, that kind of higher level change management support, right. To say, no, we're, we're, we're going to go ahead and do this a certain way because we all need to be sharing all of that institutional knowledge that we have about where our equipment is, you know, how, what are the specific procedures that that equipment has? Because as you know, as an, an aging facility, you may have 30 different types of air handling units, right? Um, and some of them require a little bit of uh, additional um, uh, maintenance, right? Uh, our different procedures here. So uh, there, there's that whole point of getting that top level buy-in and support to ensure that, you know, this is, this is something that your organization wants to do. Um, and really just dig into, okay, well, what are the issues, you know, uh, what issues are you guys having? You don't know exactly where all of these uh, pieces of equipment are. When's the last time you actually maintain them? Uh, what parts you used on that? And by really just having that conversation, it, it lets us to, to uncover that. Um, I think I went on a little bit of a tangent there, Katie, if you want to re redirect. No, I, think, <laughs> I think you did great, Rick. <laughs> um, that was, that was awesome. Thank you. I'm um, getting a lot of great questions. Um, I'm going to do my best to sort of summarize groups of them that are coming in that are sort of similar. Um, and we've got some limbo specific questions as well. So I'm going to, I'm going to stick on the track with uh, PM program real quick, and then we'll, we'll head over to some limbo stuff. Uh, but here's a, a new question. Uh, when implementing a preventive maintenance program, how do you incorporate exterior vendors and contractors, or mm. do you even include them in, in your program? Yeah, you definitely want to include them in your program, right? Um, just like you, you may have to contract out specific tasks to a vendor because you don't have the bandwidth in your team, um, or it's just you know too dangerous of a task or or too specialized, right? So you still want to have some kind of trigger to let you know that that task needs to be done. Um, sometimes you have these uh, agreements with the organization, right? And they should be reaching out to you, but it's also nice to have that information in your system. And the reason why you want to have that information in your system is not only from that reminder perspective, but also to track your total cost of ownership. You want to know how much it is costing you to maintain your facility. So without having that additional information from how much your, or what work your contractors are doing and how much work they're doing and how much it's costing you, you won't be able to get that complete operating picture of the total cost of ownership. Um, it also helps you look at justifications uh, in, in the other way, right? You know, you can say, man, this contractor doing this level of work is costing us X. You know, what if we did bring this in house? What would that, what would that take? Could we do that? And vice versa, right? So it allows you to have flexibility. Awesome. 
Um, how, I had another question. How do you go about getting the information for creating a maintenance program? Does the information come from the maintenance planner to go out and research or do the men on the ground assist in creating procedures and gathering the information? Yeah, right. And and we we kind of covered some of this, you know, the 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 very basic of it. If you know your assets and you know the make mon make and model, you can go ahead and if you don't have them, look up their manufacturer or the the uh, OEM manuals and look at the manufacturer recommendations for maintenance. So that's always the best place to start. Um uh, from my experience and working with technicians, sometimes those are a bit more frequent than they need to be, uh, but sometimes they are exactly what they need to be. And you need to kind of make that uh, justification for yourself. And, and also note that if it is tied to a warranty, well, you want to make sure that you're following that manufacturer's recommendation so you don't void that warranty as well. So yeah, that's always the best place to start. Um, there's a, there's other things that you could do if you really want to get started super fast and and be really lightweight with it. Uh, you know, there's there's tools like uh, Chat GPT that you can put in. Well, hey, what's what should my preventative maintenance program be for my what's an annual preventative maintenance program for my air handling unit? And it can spit out a couple of things for you to do, but uh, it's not perfect, and I definitely wouldn't make that the the real recommendation. But the best place to start is is that OEM manual. Awesome. Uh, another question before we move to Limbal specific stuff. Um, what are the criteria you would use, Rick, for considering whether an asset is a critical asset or not? Yeah, yeah. So, um, and we'll share that article with everybody after. Um, but the big thing there, right, is understanding what's the probability of failure versus what is the risk if that that thing fails. And so when I look at that, it's um, as an example, in a wastewater treatment plant, we may have a specific pump, right? And that pump supports this one line. And, you know, if the risk of that thing failing is probably pretty low, right? Because it's not going to stop production of our entire facility. But we may have some other pieces of equipment that are upstream that if those fail, they are going to cause significant downstream effects or may effectively shut down the plant altogether. Now, when we look at that, we can say on this matrix that the criticality or that the, the, the severity of that failure or the risk of that failure is, is high. Well, I'm going to put that, you know, give that a score. Now, if we look at probability and, and we can say based off my past experiences or our previous maintenance activities, you know, this thing has never failed or so maybe the probability of failure is pretty low. Um, or in the other instances, you know, it's, we can say that, Hey man, like our, the pa backup power system just doesn't always kick on that transformer seems to fail or that, that switch gear system seems to fail when it's, it should be switching over to backup power. So we note that that probability of failure, uh, failure is a bit higher. And then we can use that to create our criticality score in order to identify which assets that we want to maintain first. And this also can lead into, Hey man, or we're, we identified that this is our highest or most highest critical asset. And we're doing this high level PM program on it. And it's costing us X, Y, and Z. This leads us into having a CapEx conversation about maybe we should actually be replacing the equipment because we know what it's costing us to maintain that equipment. And so again, this is where that information is super powerful. So you can have that total cost of ownership. You can know how much it, it, uh, unplanned uh, work is happening, how much downtime is happening, how much that's costing your facility, what is the amount of and level of effort that it's taking based off of your time for your preventative maintenance program for that particular asset. And you can use that to have a convincing conversation with your management team about, you know, or in your finance team about replacing that equipment. Awesome. I'll move to some more uh, Limble specific questions now. Uh, and this kind of great sort of catch all one to start with. Uh, Rick, what makes Limble better than other CMMS systems on the market? Yeah, there, there's a number of things there. Um, for us, one of the main things is right is that flexibility and ease of use. Uh, so there's a lot to go on within the software itself to be able to allow um, the software to conform to your organization's needs rather than you having to conform directly to the software. And you know, aside from that, there's this great thing called our our customer support team that is bar none 
the most fantastic group of people that you will ever work with. And you will always feel supported and you will always feel heard. Uh, and that is just one of the most phenomenal things about Limble. Awesome. Um, another Limble question, how does Limble scale? Uh, number of sites, assets per site, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, definitely. So Limble can scale to your organizations. Uh, again, we have customers that are uh, you know, globally, so working in multiple different regions and have multiple sites in each one of those regions. So that allows you to, again, scale Limble to your organization. Awesome. All right, let's just thumbing through these here. You guys are asking great questions. So keep them coming if there are more. Um, Rick, can you go into uh, what some of the reporting looks like in Limble? So you mentioned uh, being able to calculate the total cost of ownership on things uh, mm -hmm. and number of hours of downtime and all of that sort of stuff. How does that work in Limble? Yeah, maybe you want to just pop back to your reporting slide instead of me opening up Limble and doing that. Totally. Test drive. But yeah, so essentially here, right, in your custom dashboards, this allows you to create custom dashboards with custom widgets. And every little box here, we have tile widgets, a bar graph, a line graph. Um, so you can create all the information that you want. So there's a little uh, workflow wizard builder that you could say, I want to see how many open PMs, how many completed PMs. Um, I want to see all the nine different tasks. I want to see which assets are costing me the most money. You can go ahead and create graphs uh, and um, reports to show exactly which assets are costing you the most money. Is it costing you the most money based off of your parts, your labor, uh, other costs, such as just invoices or contracting out? Um, so you'll be able to create all that information in a specific dashboard here that you can reference in real time, right? It's never, it's not just, let me go ahead and spit out a report and then I have to go back and generate that again. We can always see that up-to-date information right here in our custom dashboards. Awesome. And I lost my little Q&A box. I'm going to stop sharing for just a moment while I can find it again. Bear with me. Thanks, folks. There it is. Um, okay, uh, this is a really good question that I'm going to pop back to other PM program related stuff. Um, Rick, what is the best way to convince senior management on issues regarding CapEx of replacing aging equipment? Yeah, I think we covered that in that last bit, um, or in that last answer there about once you understand what your total cost of ownership is with your assets, right? And you understand, you know, how much downtime that that asset is causing you uh, and how much that is costing you. Uh, that way you can have that conversation with senior management regarding, you know, hey, we can easily see from our reports right here and we don't have to go digging for it. We don't have to go do the paper shuffle uh, and, and find that information. We can see right here, all the different tasks, how much each task costs, and uh, what our downtime is. So it really helps to have that justification. And like you said, right, um, we look at uh, the criticality of our assets and we say, hey, you know, this is the risk and the probability of the failure is really high. What's the age of this equipment? Well, if that thing goes down, how much is that potentially going to cost us on a data or an hourly basis? So um, that can be really compelling information to have when you're going to have these conversations. Awesome. Um, what does Limble offer to help with uh, implementing a PM program? Yeah, so uh, whenever you join with Limble, you get paired with a dedicated customer success manager that really helps you through the entire implementation process of the software from getting your assets in, figuring out which information that you want to track to going ahead and identifying, you know, which assets do we want to start with? Let's go create our preventive maintenance templates, our schedules, and they'll share with you a lot of the best practices. Awesome. Um, can PMs, asset management tasks, et cetera, be automated using Libel API? Yes. So if you wanted to go ahead and so say, for instance, you have uh, a different system like a SCADA system or some other kind of data historian that tracks information like uh, runtime hours, maybe it's a building management system or uh, anything else that tracks like your odometer readings on your vehicles. So again, you can take that information from those data historians and grab that and then put feed that into Limble. 
So if my runtime hours on my HVAC unit uh, increases ever so much, I can set a schedule to say every 3000 hours, I want to go ahead and do an inspection of my HVAC unit to ensure the belt is aligned and tensioned correctly. Um, and that the filter is still clean, for instance, right. And so you can feed that information into Libble. And instead of having triggers based off of calendar, you could have it based off of a meter or some kind of threshold value. Awesome. Um, let me see here. Okay, that one's answered. You guys sent great questions. Now I'm like, have to find my place in them. <laughs> uh, there's one about providing asset inventory services or do ah, you need yeah. a completed, uh, bring a completed inventory to you? Um, there is on-site implementation services that do come at an additional cost that you could uh, go ahead and, and um, purchase if you'd like to have somebody come on site to help do that inventorying and implementation process. Awesome. Um Multiple sites for techs who work in different company configurations. Can you speak to that, Rick? Yeah, I mean, I'll speak to it in the terms of creating a preventative maintenance program. Um, but yeah, uh, each of your preventative maintenance templates are specific to each of your locations or, or sites, right, in Limble. So you, if you have different techs that work at uh, different sites and those sites have specific configurations for their preventative maintenance um, schedules and templates, like their standard operating procedures, then yeah, again, you can customize that based off of, of that. Awesome. I will, I'll do one more question uh, and then we'll start to wrap things up. Um, but uh, Rick, could you talk about uh, how the asset ledger works with associating with parts uh, and related equipment and all of that stuff um, in Limble? Sorry, say that one more time. Associating assets with parts uh, and tools and that sort of thing and, and how you can mm -hmm. leverage that in a PM program with Limble. Yeah, yeah. Maybe if you pop back to uh, the slide, I think benefit slide one. Yeah, create SOPs. Yeah. Um, yeah. And your screens, it's in the note view. You're not sharing the actual um, oh. presentation here. Thank you. Let me try again. How's that better? Yeah, perfect. So here, uh, as an example, right, you can see the how it's customized. So this is what a task right looks like in Limbo. Here's all of my um, all my different instructions that I've created that are specific to my organization in this particular inspection. Uh, and one of the things that you can do is actually, uh, but in the template itself, to add parts. All right. So say for instance, it's my annual preventive maintenance for my air handling unit, and I know it needs three 12 by five by one filters and it needs one 25 by 25 you know whatever filter right and maybe it needs three belts so i can go ahead and add all of those parts to my um, preventative maintenance template so that when that uh tasks triggers out that the technician already knows hey here are all the parts that i need to go grab uh, additionally, we have the ability for you to associate tools. So if there are specific tools that you want your technicians to go ahead and check out, uh, maybe it's like a, a FLIR thermal imaging camera, and you only have one of those at the facility and that's shared by different technicians. It's not part of their standard uh, tool set. And this is something that's, you know, maybe in a tool, tool crib. Uh, you can go ahead and again, add that, that tool to the task. So they can go ahead and easily see if anybody has it checked out, if they want to go ahead and check out that tool. Um, and they know if it's, you know, in stock so they can go ahead and do their work. So the key point to all of this and all of this and getting all that information on there is to know, or is to let the technician know, here's exactly what you need. And is it in stock or not? So you can do this work. Awesome. Thank you so much for answering all those questions, Rick, and uh, all of you that are in attendance. Thank you so much for asking them uh, so we can have a really fruitful discussion here.
Um, there were still some more, uh, like lots of Limble specific questions that were coming through. Uh, and we would love to be able to show you the software in a little bit more depth. Um, so the best way to do that is uh, go to limblecmms.com slash demo dash request and set up an appointment with a uh, product specialist so they can show you uh, exactly the things that you want to see to solve the maintenance problems that you are trying to solve. Uh, Rick, do you have, have any last words that you want to give for our attendees? Just uh, thanks everybody for joining and listening to me uh, talk today. I really do appreciate you giving me the chance to share uh, some of the experiences and, and uh, a little bit more about Limble as well. So I appreciate that and uh, look forward to working with each and every one of you. Wonderful. Thank you everyone for attending. Um, after this, you'll, you should receive an email with the recording of this session, as well as some additional resources that we mentioned as well. Uh, and, you know, if you have other questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to us, send us an email, give us a call, uh, and we're more than happy to help. Thanks everyone. Have a great day.